Hey everybody, welcome to Dad, Son, and a Game, Episode 2. Today we're looking at a game that we alluded to in the first episode. It comes from Tasty Minstrel Games as well, called Belfort. I'm Joel, and this is... Luke. And we're here to tell you a little something about this game. Well, first of all, Luke, what do you want to tell us about the game? I think it's a pretty good game overall. Um, very good for families, so yeah, I would definitely recommend it to a family. Yeah. Uh, so that's Luke's thoughts on it. Uh, first off, the game is, is called Belfort, and basically you're building the city of Belfort. And the king of Belfort, or whatever of Belfort, doesn't entirely trust you. Uh, so he basically thinks that you are a crooked contract. And because he doesn't trust you, he's hired a bunch of contractors to do the work so that you compete with each other. That's basically it. The first thing you notice about this game when you take it out of the box is the unique board. Uh, it's got these diamond-shaped tiles that go together to make a pentagonal board. And all these diamond-shaped tiles represent districts in the city of Belfort. They're all identical. And you're going to be building, building buildings in these different districts to try and compete with each other to try and be the winner ultimately in Belfort. Uh, so these tiles go together and make this really nice looking pentagonal board. And here we can take a closer look at the board uh, and just see how nice that art really looks on there. As we zoom down you can just see these buildings are really kind of cool looking on there. And there's a scoring track around the outside edge where you keep track of your points but there's also some coins there so as you score points you're going to have to pay taxes on, on the amount of, of uh, points you scored. So you need to make sure to balance scoring with being able to pay your taxes throughout the game, which is another kind of neat aspect on it. Now, how do we build these buildings? That's probably the next question that we need to answer. Well, that comes from these blueprint cards that we have. Uh, these blueprint cards show us the cost of the building up here in the uh, upper left-hand corner there. It shows us how much it costs. So the market here costs one wood, three stone, and two steel. And then there's also a couple locks here and a spot to stick a worker. So these cards not only build buildings, but they give you a benefit as well. Uh, this one this one here is the market. It gives us some coins and extra trades. So that's pretty useful. And uh, here's where I'm going to go and head and do my best Tom Vassal impersonation and throw some components on the board here for you guys to see. Well, now we've seen the possibility of uh, where workers can go, but now we need to take a look at the workers themselves. First off, we have these square guys who are dwarfs. The dwarfs can do a lot of different mining to get stone. They also help with steel production, but then also they can go on any of those combination circle square slots like on the cards we saw there. Next, we have these wood elves. Now, I have two types of wood elves here. The first type is a plain one. The second one's an upgraded one with the starburst. The dwarfs can do the same thing. The starburst guy that I just pointed to there, he, uh, he can actually double, collect, double collects resources, which is really nice and shows a lot of power that he has. Uh, but those guys are kind of expensive to create. So... That's an example of the different kind of workers we have. Now there's one more thing I need to make sure you uh, are able to see here is this little Monopoly house. Those Monopoly houses are exactly uh, right here. This Monopoly house is exactly uh, what we're going to put on the board to show where we've built at. And the cards that we build are going to have symbols that match on the board to show where we've built. It's going to be important to put those different markers in different spots in uh, different districts to, to try and get your most points there because uh, like the scoring of this game is uh, basically calculated by who has the most. Now the next component we can take a look at here is our player mats. Now the player mats are really nice. They're one of the parts of the game that I really think is great. It shows you exactly uh, how much everything costs to build there. And then also on the side here, it kind of gives us a cheat sheet. It shows us how many of each component we start off with. So we start off with uh, one of each of these resources here. And on the other side, it shows us that we start with three of each kind of worker. And then there's also a nice round summary that comes there. And we have our, our uh, round summary rules there. And then it shows a scoring track on the top. So that helps us with the scoring when we do end up doing scoring on the game. We talked a little bit about resources earlier. Here's what the resources look like that we're going to be gathering with our workers to use to build uh, different things throughout the, the city. We have logs, stone, and steel. The logs are the brown, obviously. The steel is the cubic uh, brownish colored things. And then the steel are actually kind of a cool glittery painted color there. So that's what our resources look like. And we're going to also have gold coins in this game. 
uh, as another piece. Those aren't made out of wood, but they are really nice cardboard stock that they come on. Uh, these are also another thing that we use to either make trades for more resources um, or to use to place workers to get resources. So those are another critical component and again, a nice quality. Okay, and next I want us to look at this. Uh, this is a board all of us are going to take a look at. Now the top here shows the calendar track, which is where we're going to keep track of which round we're in. There's seven rounds. The rounds with X's on them are the rounds where we do scoring. This also shows us that we can hire gnomes and get more blueprints. Uh, right there's the scoring track I talked about a minute ago. And then at the bottom here, it talks about the trading post, which is where we can trade some goods in for gold or trade in gold for goods. Obviously, the trading post is going to rip us off a little bit, but with poor planning, you can correct that. So now I'm going to place a guy here in the city of Belfort. I'm going to stick my little dwarf here in this spot. And he had a gold coin underneath him, so I have to pay that gold coin to place him there. Uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to place anyone there because I don't have any benefit from placing anyone there that you can see yet. Um, but we'll get back to that. Now, here's the other more generic re uh, resource placement thing. Now, first we have the King's Court. If I place a player here, a worker here, I get to change my turn order. So that's a good uh, spot to go if you're one of the last players or one of the first players and you want to be last. The second is the Recruitment Center. Uh, that part is where you can actually put a, uh, a worker there and a couple gold coins to recruit another worker. And then on the top part, you can collect your gold your stone and your and your wood by placing different workers different places so if i place some of these elves in that quadrant i get some wood if i if i place these square guys in the the mines i get some uh stone and then i guess more of a quarry than a mine and then i have a mine where i can stick a combination of workers in to get a steel and then i can stick either worker in the last column there to get one or the other and then also the cards can receive players or receive receive uh workers as well. Like this card here, if you stick a worker in there, you get two gold coins for placing him there. So that's some of the benefits you get from building some of the different uh, blueprints in the city. It's a, it's a pretty powerful card though that you get two gold coins from placing someone there as opposed to one where you stick them in the generic slot. Uh, the other thing too is if you have the most workers in any of those four generic columns on the other board, you get a bonus of uh, the most worker bonus for having that many workers in there. So in a nutshell, this is uh, more or less what the game is. There's one other part we really need to talk about yet, though, uh, before you can get a real good feel for the game. The one last thing we need to talk about here are guilds. Guilds go on the board in the town, and the guilds basically give you a benefit by placing a worker in them. Uh, so this guild gives you four, it's the Sawyer's Guild, so it gives you four lumber for placing a worker there, which is four times the amount of lumber you would get just by using the generic slot. There's all kinds of different guilds. There's the Miner's Guild, which is going to allow you to get two steel instead of just uh, the one typical that you would get. And also, you don't have to place two workers to get that. There's all kinds of guilds. There's interactive guilds. There's basic guilds. There's um, resource guilds. And you can set up your game all kinds of different ways with that, which it really increases the replayability of this game. And that's a real nice feature of what's going on here. And the last thing I want to talk about are these gnomes. Uh, there were locks on the cards that you saw earlier. Gnomes unlock extra powers on the cards. You can either buy the, the gnomes or you can produce them with different structures and buildings. They get kind of cost costly, but there that gives you an extra action in the market if you buy a gnome and unlock that. You can also buy a second gnome for this card, which is kind of a unique characteristic to get a second one. And the, also, the other thing about gnomes and getting extra workers is you're going to go ahead and score points by having the most gnomes, dwarves, or elves. Uh, on a particular uh, scoring round, as well as having the most, most in the, each, by having the most buildings in each quadrant that you're building in. So that's how you, you win, is by building the most buildings in a specific quadrant and having the most work. And that's going to allow you to score the most points to go ahead and win. Now, I didn't give a very thorough explanation of this game. Uh, watch It Play did a really nice job of covering all this stuff, so I suggest you watch his video. All right, so that's the game of Belfort in a nutshell. What do you think of it, Luke? Um, very good game. Honestly, probably one of my favorites, so... In your top ten, huh? Yeah. Okay, so first off, fun factor. Is this a fun game? Yeah, I would give it probably an eight out of a ten for... For, for the fun, huh? Mm-hmm. I would say it's pretty high for fun for me as well. Uh, I would probably say eight and a half out of ten on the fun factor, too. It just has a lot of fun to it. It gets a little repetitive, but at times it's a ten out of ten for fun. 
At times it's a 7 out of 10 for fun. It's a little long, a little repetitive, but it's a good game overall. Yeah. Alright, next up, let's talk about how the artwork is in the game and how it matches the theme. What do you think of that? Um, I do think the artwork and the theme go very well together. Just because, you know, mythical elves and stuff. Yeah. And this pretty basic art. So. It's it's a pretty cool game. I'm going to give it like a 7 out of 10 or 7.5 out of 10 because I think the city has really great art in it. But I think the elves and the gnomes kind of, I don't know, I know they're made to look goofy, but they just kind of look goofy. Mm -hmm. So, and I know they're made to look that way, but... I don't know, it just didn't draw me in, like the art of the gnomes and the, I and the elves. I honestly would give it a 9 out of 10 because, well, maybe an 8 and a half. But because I think the goal of the artist on the game was to make the art like very random and goofy and just kind of tacky. Yeah, I mean, you can see, it's definitely not taking itself seriously. We have a, a gnome here with some kind of protective glasses on, and that's the same thing with an elf up here. So, I mean, it's definitely not taking itself too seriously, but at the same time, I, I don't know, the city looks really good. I don't know how I feel about the, the characters. All right, the last thing we're going to look at is component quality, uh, as far as the actual cardboard goes. The card components in it are excellent. Uh, I say this gets a 9 out of 10. I just don't think that you could do a whole lot better with these components. The board is amazing. The tiles are amazing. They're actual wood, uh, not cardboard, and you get wooden, wooden bits of materials. Luke has one complaint about it. And it is well. I have the same out of ten rating. Nine out of ten. For, yep. But my complaint is there's a sticker sheet that you have to put stickers on the pieces, which is kind of a pain. Yeah, we were excited to play a new game and then we had to put stickers on a board game for 15 minutes before we could play. Which we understand is to make the game not cost $100 and cost 30 something dollars instead. So it's a it's a sacrifice that's worth having to pay. Um, so that's that. The last thing we're going to talk about is the age and learning curve on this game. Luke learned this game pretty quickly. He didn't think it was too challenging. Um, what do you think? It probably goes down um, and time. Sorry, I forgot what I was saying. Because you were like busy doing this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna puke. No, it's just. It looked like you were gonna that. puke up your golden bread. Golden bread. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't need to see too much more golden bread. Uh, anyway, you look like you were gonna puke. Are you okay? Yeah, it's just that this is really not comfortable. <laughs> He's sitting on a bucket right now to make him kind of like as tall as me. So we'll have to find him a stool next time. Anyway, what did you think about the learning curve? You started hard and got easier? Yeah. And why is that? It's because it's very repetitive and it just goes on and on. Yeah. The game is seven rounds of the same thing. So once you learn the vocabulary, once you learn the mechanic, you get good at it by the time you're done playing that first game. So I would say it starts off with a complexity that would be difficult for a nine-year-old or ten-year-old to learn. But by the end of the game, it'd just, be easy. Yeah, like a... Not a one, but... Like a one-year-old could play this game? No. Like you're going to give like a toddler like, like some cardboard to chew on and be like, play this game. No, I'm talking about a skill of <laughs> one to ten. So you wouldn't let a one-year-old play this game? No. Okay. Well, anyway, that's our thoughts on Belfort. Uh, thanks for watching. Hopefully we made this one in under a half an hour. The last one got a little lengthy. So at any rate, that's all, and we'll talk to you later. Bye. A little better second time around, what do you think? Yeah. Cool. Although, except for that part where it looks like I was puking.